views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. Over the many years of our program, we've talked about health disparities a number of times, and uh, maybe now more than ever uh, with uh, the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, it is even more apparent to the people of the Bronx that some people get better health care than others, and also, frankly, uh, some people are more susceptible to disease and uh, in infections and, and viruses like uh, the one that is uh, running rampant uh, than others. And uh, so the notion of disparities is still out there, it hasn't gone away in, in all the years that we've been doing uh, Bronx Talk on uh, Bronx Net Television. But there may be one aspect of this that a lot of people aren't aware of. And I have to tell you, I think it may be at the foundation of some of the disparity issues when uh, many Bronx people walk into their doctor's office. And, and I'm going to give you a, um, uh, a, a number that was passed along to me um, in New York State. Uh, blacks, uh, African Americans, and Hispanics, Latinos were approximately 31% of the population. That's not a surprise. But only 12% of the physician workforce. And that means for many Bronxites, when they walk into a doctor's office, they don't see somebody that looks like them. And they will listen, we're not looking for a mirror image, but we're looking for somebody who understands you, your culture, your history, and, and uh, you know all the associated medical uh, issues that could come up, and we've seen it, um, unfortunately, living out, um, you know, in plain, in plain daylight um, uh, over the last uh, several months. So this evening, we're going to talk about um, health disparities, specifically making sure that our physician workforce looks like the people that they are serving, especially in our borough of the Bronx. Please join me in welcoming uh, Ms. Joe Wiederhorn, who's the president and CEO of Associated Medical Schools of New York. Uh, Ms. Wiederhorn, nice to have you with us. Thank you. Nice to be here. And also um, the Assistant Dean for Diversity Enhancement at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. They have been working on this issue since day one. Uh, and that goes back to 1955. She hasn't been here since then, but nonetheless, <laughs> Hilda Soto, nice to see you again. Good evening. Um, let's, uh, Ms. Wiederhorn, let's start with you. You put out a, a study sure. which really was very interesting. Um, and, and really hits the nail on the head, addressing the challenges of a diverse physician workforce. Why did uh, AMSNY take a step back and say, we got to study this, we got to put this out, we got to put our arms around it and take a hold of it? What, what, what's the, the motivation here? Well, I think one of the motivations is really when you look at the medical school population, um, there aren't enough students that are diverse students who are now in medical school. So we started looking at, well, what is the reason for that? Uh, and that led to the development of the report that we did. Um, and uh, it really was very, uh, we interviewed students of color so we could get their perspective. We introduced, I mean, we interviewed faculty. Um, and I think it's a very well-rounded report. We only look at the um, uh, the problems that happen when students enter uh, college, right? We don't go all the way back, but if you want to really get to the real crux of what the problem is, you have to go back to middle middle school, high school, and I know that Dean Soto at Einstein has been running programs for kids of this age now for a couple of years. Um, and so we rely on programs like the one that she does uh, in order to get us uh, some students who are interested in going to medical school. Yeah, and, get, and get them up to speed. I have to say that the minute you said we want to go further back than just college, 
I, I knew that that's where we were going. So we're going to hold that for a moment. Okay. I want to know about the effect of, uh, you know, the, the person to person effect. I mean, I addressed that in my opening remarks, but the person to person effect of uh, when somebody uh, goes into a doctor's office and you know, never sees or rarely sees a doctor that looks like them. What is the effect and how does that play when it comes to administering uh, the healthcare, which again, right now is of even more important than health. Right. right. Uh, I think that once, um, if, if a person goes in and sees a physician who, are, who is of the same culture or background that they are, the, the whole doctor patient relationship changes. So if, if I were to see someone, well, you know, I have a white physician and I can go in and he pretty much understands where I'm coming from when I'm talking to him. But different people, different cultures, you know, they have different ways of eating or of discussing things with doctor, what they feel comfortable with or not. And so if they have someone of their own background, um, it makes it much better for them. They feel more comfortable. They'll trust the, the individual more. And ultimately what will happen is there'll be better health care outcomes. A and this was shown in a study uh, that was done out in Oakland by Stanford uh, physicians where they took a group of black men and divided them and gave um, some of them black doctors and some of them non-black doctors. And one of the things that came out of this was that the men who saw the black doctors um, were more willing to go in and get uh, hypertension checked, to get their diabetes checked. They were more likely to come back for a second appointment. Um, they were, their treatment outcomes basically were much, di much different, much better than those uh, who saw non-black physicians. I, I think the, the germ, if you will, pardon the pun, the germ of, of the idea for me is communication. That when you yes. walk into a doctor's office and you may have some personal issues and they may be issues that are related to relationships or other issues, or as you said, maybe your, your access to food or diet or any number of, uh, you know, ability to have fitness. If you have somebody who you can, like when you meet your friend, you can communicate and, and then you, you go back and forth. If you walk into a doctor's office and there is even nothing, nobody doing or thinking anything untoward, but there's not that immediate, you know, generic energy. I think I right. think really, really affect. Um, I want to bring uh, Ms. Soto in there. So let's just uh, rewind the history books a little bit. I, I have this, uh, which you had shared with me a couple of years ago, actually, this incredible letter, which is, is really the founding document uh, about uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, uh, goes way back to 1955, signed by Albert Einstein himself. And Albert Einstein said, if we're going to have a medical school, which originally was um, for, for Jews, uh, to, to bring them into the workforce, but he made it clear that uh, we ought to have um, uh, an institution that welcomes students of all uh, creeds and races. Talk to me about the, the founding of Albert Einstein College of Medicine and um, you know, where you were and where you are now to get to that realize uh, you know, uh, Mr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein's dream. Well, yes, as, as the letter states, um, so what was happening after World War II was that Jews were being discriminated against their quotas on Jews entering the medical profession. And Yeshiva University decided, well, let's create our own. They reached out to the humanitarian um, Albert Einstein, who was at Princeton at the time. He was in the United States. And he agreed. And that little letter that he sent, you know, put the foundation down. He says, okay. And, and the discussions that were created at the time of starting the school, he put down that, hey, this is one that was going to incorporate people from a lot of different races and creeds and gender. Um, so I'll fast forward. Um, 
just to give you a sense, our Office of Diversity Enhancement got started in the 80s. And this past January, I um, celebrated my 30th year at Albert Einstein. Well, I'm going to applaud. Congratulations. Yes. We, need, we need great I, professionals, I, and we have one here. Go ahead. Yes. So I, I share that because it shows the commitment, the continuity, the support. Now, of course, with the passage of time, there are now different individuals who are underrepresented in medicine. Um, and so the, the institution is made a commitment. Plus, with the medical school sitting in the Bronx. And you know, as you know, and I'm a native Bronx, I still live in the Bronx, is that we are predominantly um, either Black or Latino. And the institution, Einstein, recognizes that, that need and that support. So we've had a, 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 a long-term commitment. We've had a high school program that is state funded. And I've been director of it for over 30 years. So it's, it existed before I started. And it's the, the Department of Education and, 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 and the State of the Department of Education, the Science Technology Program of STEP. And our specific program um, requires that the participants live and go to school in the Bronx. It's an after school program. So it's a further commitment that Einstein is making. We're trying to capture those young people who are aspiring, who are curious, who wish to go into health professions, many of them in medicine, but we, you know, we've had pharmacists and dentists and so forth, um, and giving them an opportunity for exposure giving them skill set because we do like SAT prep. Um, we just had our seventh, eighth grade component, by the way, where we're preparing these youngsters for the standardized high school admissions test, the Bronx mm -hmm. High School, the Stuyvesant yes. exam. We, we, we um, provide some support for seventh and eighth graders. Do you, do you see a result to that? And, and listen, uh, anybody in any profession now, and I, I talk to people in all different industries, they always want to reach young people in middle school, especially and in high school, because that's when they begin formulating. Do you see, since you've been running this program for a while, a real result that, you know, it, it, it seems kind of difficult to look at somebody who's 14 years old, and then one day, you know, when they're 23, they're going to be a doctor. Do you see that uh, progression? Does it happen? Has this worked? Yes, yes. Well, one of the things, remember, we're working with Bronx High School students. We work with both public and parochial school students with an effort in, in, uh, to try to reach out to young Black men and Latino men. 100%, 100% of my high school students go on to four-year colleges. Okay, so that is a, not the demographic for the public or parochial school, you know, 100% of those youngsters. Mm -hmm. And then yes, we have a chance have to get them to be, um, to go to medical school and become doctors. Yes. yes, so we have had some of our students come back to us, to our medical school, to our residency. Um, we just had a very dynamic young woman who just got accepted to the Sophie Davis program, which is a combined wow. college and medical school, the M and a BSMD program. So yes, so we've been able to see the results. I, 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 ask, I, I just want to share something sure. about the competency and, and um, uh, Ms. Wiederhorn shared that how the compliance of that study that, you know, having a physician that comparable looks like you. My mother's 96 and her primary doctor is one of our Einstein graduates. He's not necessarily a pipeline person, but for, he was a school teacher and he's from Honduras. And I used to tease him that I wanted him to be my mother's doctorcito. And two years ago, he became my mother's doctor and she's thrilled. This is the only time my mother, when she hasn't felt well, has said to me, you have to call my doctorcito. She has never said that wow. at all. But um, so, you, so I want to I want to move it ahead, and I do want to get back to Ms. Weedorn. So you have seen it happen. You have seen it work, and even in your personal life, that's a that's a very dramatic story. I want to ask each of you a question. We'll start with you, Ms. Soto, and then Ms. Weedorn. What has the coronavirus pandemic done to? Un I, I introduced the program that way to underscore the, the this issue and why. How did it play during, you know, the, the real, uh, uh, you know, uh, rush that we had here in the Bronx? And, and why did it make it so that we've really got to focus on this now? So well, because we've been, the Bronx, 
the Bronx has been devastated. Um, you know, our primary teaching hospital is um, Montefiore, but also we train people in Jacoby. The devastation of, you know, we were getting daily and then became weekly reports of the number of individuals who had been tested from Voda virus, a COVID virus, and also, you know, people who needed to be on ventilator. And predominantly, these were Black and Latino individuals. And because of the access to care prior, pre-existing health conditions, the essential worker thing, uh, um, jobs that they have, it was very devastating um, in terms of the work that needed to be done to ensure that these people, the outcome would be positive. I, I so think we were yeah, Boots I, on the I, ground. Yeah, I want to uh, bring Ms. Wiedelhorn. I think, and, and I thank goodness was not in that circumstance, but I think if you're in that circumstance, you're being intubated, you're dealing with a ventilator, you, your life is literally on the line. If you open up your eyes and see somebody who you believe mentally is you, reflects you, understands you instinctively, you're probably going to do better. Ms. Wiedelhorn, let's bring you back in. Talk to me about how this has played in the pandemic. And if we could, you know, change this, we, we and of course all patients would do better. Well, I, I actually, I think Dean Soto um, summarized it very well. Um, the only thing that I would add to that is that, you know, when you have bad health outcomes before the virus, when you're not going to a doctor, when you uh, live in an environmentally um, poor place so that your environment actually um, hinders your, your health, um, you're going to come into something like the pandemic and have worse outcomes. There's no doubt about it. Um, to be able to open your eyes and see somebody who looks like you is wonderful. If, you're, if your main language is Spanish, and you can't talk to your family because they're behind you know, glass on the other side if they're even in the hospital. To be able to communicate with someone um, who can understand what you're saying and can then communicate that back to your family is above and beyond. Um, Crucial, it's, it's, yes. It, yeah. and, and again, just using that example that I presented, Think about that, that somebody is, you know, in this just horrible situation and they may be Spanish speaking and the doctor has to say, oh, I have to bring somebody over That's who right. can understand. And then, you know, in, in what in many cases, it's just horrible to think were somebody's last words or last communication. It had right. to be translated. That, that's just not fair. It's, it's very upsetting, to be honest with you. Yeah. It's upsetting to me. Um, uh, I, I want to talk about funding now. The, um, uh, the uh, association, uh, let's talk about um, the Association of uh, Medical um, Schools in New York. Um, let's talk about funding. I've had this conversation with uh, Ms. Soto in the past. Um, what, what needs to be done aside from, yes, educating, um, you know, training, bringing people up from, from um, you know, uh, middle school and beyond? But what can be done from a funding point of view, whether it be through the state legislature or other sources mm -hmm. to really pump this and move this forward? Well, um, from a funding point of view, uh, the more money, the better. Um, you <laughs> Get know. online, lady. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. Punk's language. Sorry. <laughs> uh, um, but I think that, you know, we need programs, we need funding for programs that are mentoring programs so that the students who, you know, finish up uh, Dean Soto's program and go to college, they have somebody that they can talk to and call on to help them when they're faced with barriers, uh, which, which uh, are very difficult for them to overcome. Uh, we need funding for uh, MCAT prep programs or uh, MCAT um, uh, total application programs. So, for instance, the MCAT is the test that the students have to take uh, to get into medical school. So, uh, it's a very difficult test, uh, very difficult for um, people to take and to get high enough scores on so that they can get an interview. Uh, so. What 
actually there's a program at Einstein that's uh, run by Dr. Lynn Holden, uh, where she actually does preparation for students for how you take this test. You know, it's one of those standardized tests that if you know how to take it, uh, it makes it a lot easier to do well on it and to not be frightened about it. But she also does things like um, teach students how to present themselves, how to write an essay so that they can get into college, I mean, into medical school. I mean, she, she helps them with the whole sort of package of what it is that they need to do uh, to present themselves to an admissions committee. We need a lot more programs like that in this state. Um, there just aren't enough of them. And we lose people along the way because there aren't these programs for them to go to. Uh, we actually run four what are known as what we call our post bath programs. Uh, three of them provide master's degrees. These are all for underrepresented students. Three of them provide master's degrees. The students have to apply to medical school. And once they apply, they are interviewed. If the admissions committee thinks that they would do great, they just need another year of academic support or help, they need uh, to learn how to study, those sorts of things, then they will refer them to one of our post-baccalaureate programs. Uh, if the student successfully completes it, they're automatically going to the medical school that referred them. So, yeah, they don't have to reapply, nothing. So, you know, that program, we've had enormous success. That program's been running since 1991. 94% of the students who go through the program end up in medical school. Um, and 85% of those actually graduate and go on to residency and become doctors. And, and these are students that wouldn't have gotten into medical school uh, otherwise, because if they do get into a medical school, they can't go through our program. You know, you know I, I, I like the idea that there are some successes in there. And when you go back to the word germ, to me, that germ is motivating people to say, Number one, it's a problem. Number two, it's obviously a wonderful career you need to you know, achieve to get to that career. I just think if we could continue to motivate uh, young people to do it and say, wait a minute, this is for you. Just because you haven't seen doctors right. like that, this is for you. And we right. this back to Dean Soto. Let's, let's just talk about um, young people that you talk to or young people in those programs. Is it, is it a hard sell? I mean, do you have to sell oh, it? No, or what? no, no. no. They're, no, they're thrilled no, with no. the opportunity, right? They, 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 you know, we have so much potential. I mean, our program is small. Um, our funding, um, it's a state funded program, the one from seventh to 12th grade. And so we get into, you know, for every application or seat in the, in the program, we'll get anywhere from six to eight applications. We just can't incorporate everybody. These are highly motivated um, young people. Their parents, see, there's a variety of components to, to, when people say, why is your program so successful? We, the parents and significant others are very much engaged. Even if we have parents meetings, even if they're not English dominant, they see the value of education. They want their children to succeed. Yeah, there, you know, there is tons of young, potential young people. And part of it also is there's, there, some of them are in, in situations, and let's say they're well-intentioned educators or others who question their ability. Medical oh, school is hard. Medical school is long. Medical school costs a lot for you to go. So why don't you consider this other thing? Yeah, you know, um, I, I wanted to ask you about um, the infrastructure of the Department of Education because many of our students, um, you know, go in there. I wonder if, uh, and, and maybe that, that then uh, brings in uh, AMSNY, I wonder if there's a way to get in there and you know, kind of nudge the DOE to say, you know what, you have opportunities here and our young people need these opportunities. And as opposed to an after school program, I mean, I want to see it, I want to see it curricular and, and graduate all these kids into it. So uh, Ms. Soto and then Ms. Wiederhorn, I'm sure they're, they're both going to say, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, 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 we do have, 
you know, we focus on the Bronx. So we do have um, collaborations and um, individuals who are resources for us who will help identify when we do have openings, um, which is twice a year, um, that we work with. Um, we've been able, we're fortunate to have individuals that see the potential and want their particular students to succeed. Um, we have not necessarily launched, you know, whether it's Bronx wide, let's say the, all the Bronx high school superintendent or something like that. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm pushing. I want it to be Bronx wide. <laughs> <laughs> and I, listen, I have no problems. I have no problems with that. And, but, and the fact that our program is limited, because I get calls from Staten Island, Brooklyn, um, but it's but an after school program. Um, yeah. Now, let's see, um, um, we talked about parents, um, there are uh, educators, I'm sure, who are out there, science teachers, uh, biology teachers, et cetera, et cetera, and even and guidance people. counselors. Right. Um, how do they get to you to say, hey, I want an opportunity, um, do they call, do they email, what do they got to do to get in on AECOM? Okay, so so some people, you know, they pick up the phone or they, they go on different websites. They Some of them will look at the directory of the science technology entry program, the STEP, and they start calling around. Um, there are other STEP programs in the Bronx. Um, we're the only one that focuses purely on health professions because it's, it's a, it, the STEP is for the licensed professions. Um. And so is there a phone number you want to put out or just look up that program? Look up that program. Right. We're limited in staff because we're virtual right now. So people calling, we, you know, we're we'll only there a few days a week. Yeah, but we'll get to you. Well, listen, we want people in there. Uh, let's talk um, and now uh, the final words from uh, Ms. Weirhorn and the Associated uh, Medical Schools of New York. Um, just w what's the bottom line? What's the message? And to whom is that message delivered? Are we looking at elected officials? I mean, what, what is your bottom line message here, aside from informing us of this very difficult and important issue? Well, I actually have two messages. One is not only to elected officials, because we have had very strong support from elected officials. Um, but of course, particularly in these times, we would really rat, we would really like to ensure our programs are going to continue, which, you know, given uh, COVID-19 and the state budget, every program is sort of up to getting cut, right? Review, so, yeah. Yeah. So um, we keep thinking that, you know, these are programs that directly relate to health care for underserved communities, and therefore, and we have great success rates, and therefore we hope that we won't get cut. But we're also looking to philanthropy. Um, our, so we have that as our bottom line to help our programs continue. But the other and, thing and that- Be quick, we got about 15 seconds to do okay, it. Okay, the other thing I wanna say is that there are programs out there for students, young students who are interested in going to medical school. And they can actually contact our office and we will be able to connect them with programs throughout the city that will help them get into medical school. Right. So that's the answer to what uh, Dean Soto said about people calling from Staten Island, Brooklyn. Listen, right, exactly. Um, uh, Joe Wiederhorn, the president and CEO of Associated Medical Schools of New York, thank you so much and thank you for your passion. Thank you. Try and right the wrongs and, and get everybody good health care. And uh, Dean uh, Nilda Soto from uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, thanks for your continued work. Every day you're doing it and uh, for many, many years and we all appreciate it. Folks, we'll see you next week on Bronx Talk and on the Bronx Bus. Goodbye.